All right. Okay. So we are reading chapter 15 of Took today. Uh, just a reminder of what happened in chapter 14. <clears throat> um, Mr. and Mrs. O'Neill had some visitors at their house, um, Brody and Celine and Daniel. And they had kind of, they had lunch and they talked about what they were going to do. And so Mrs. O'Neill came up with the idea that they're going to go and visit someone who apparently is an, or is a descendant of old auntie. And her name was Miss Perkins. And so they're going to go visit Miss Perkins um, to kind of try to figure out if they can get Erica back. So here we are, chapter 15. <clears throat> I let myself into the house quietly, no fire in the living room, no smell of cooking, but I heard low voices in the kitchen. Mom and dad were sitting at the table, their breakfast dishes pushed to one side. Last night's pots and pans and dishes filled the sink. Crop by surprise, they looked at me as if I were a stranger. Daniel? Dad said. We thought you'd stay overnight with the O'Neills. The snow and all. He waved a hand vaguely at the window. It's almost stopped. Mom turned her attention from me to her comfort to her cup of coffee. I'd never seen her look so bad. Her hair was limp and uncombed. Her face had shadowed with grief. She wore an old U-mass sweatshirt and baggy corduroy pants, the same clothes she'd worn since Erica disappeared. Dad hadn't shaved and gray stubble covered his cheeks. His eyes were puffy and red-rimmed. He wore a navy sweatshirt and sweatpants, an outfit he usually reserved for watching TV after dinner. There was an empty wine bottle on the table and an ashtray full of cigarette butts and ashes. What's going on? I asked, fearful that something bad had happened. They'd found Erica dead in the snow or frozen in the woods or, or nothing, Dad said. Nothing is going on. Nothing has changed. She's still missing and no one wants to look for her in the snow. They don't want to look for her at all, Mom said. Even the state police say it's hopeless. She lit a cigarette and inhaled so deeply that she coughed. Please don't smoke, Dad said. You know I hate it. I'll smoke if I want to. She gave him a nasty look. Calms my nerves. Dad shoved his, shoved his chair away from the table and started up the back stairs. Where are you going, Ted? Mom called. To check my email, just in case. Just in case what? Just in case. He didn't finish the sentence. Face it, we'll never see her again. Mom started crying. Dad went to his den and slammed the door. My parents had lost their minds. Their marriage was collapsing. The only way to fix things was to find Erica and bring her home. And no one can do that except me. The next day was gray and cloudy, and the snow was pockmarked <clears throat> with drops falling from trees. School wasn't closed, but Mom said she didn't want me to go back yet. That was fine with me. The kids and the teachers would torment you with questions, she said. I don't want them making you even more miserable. People are so insensitive at times like this. Is it okay if I go to Woodville with Mrs. O'Neill? She knows someone who might be able to help Celine. Mom shrugged. Go ahead, do what you want, but please tell Mrs. O'Neill I want Erica's doll returned. Her voice sounded mean and hard again. The mother I used to know had disappeared with Erica. Mom went to the kitchen and stood at the window. <clears throat> Sorry, smoking and watching the woods as if she were waiting to see Erica run toward the house. Dad was working at his computer. He'd set up a website in hope of getting in touch with someone who'd seen Erica. He had lots of hits, all worthless. A man had seen her in a diner in Kentucky. A woman had seen her in Walmart in Tennessee. Someone saw her waving frantically from the rear window of a car on I-95 North. She was in Alaska, Italy, California, on buses, planes, trains. Those who hadn't seen her either prayed for her or accused my father of faking the disappearance. Maybe he'd murdered her. Maybe he wanted money. Yet dad checked every one of them and alerted the police when he received a sighting. With no one to talk to and nothing to do, I spent most of the day in my room playing games on my iPad to keep from blaming myself over and over again for Erica's disappearance. Why hadn't I let her pick up the doll? Why? Why? The phone rang around two. It was Mrs. O'Neill coming by for me in half an hour. If that was okay with my parents. I told her it was fine. I didn't say they probably wouldn't even notice I was gone. When Mrs. O'Neill arrived, she handed me the clothes Celine had helped herself to. I left them on the porch so I wouldn't have to go back inside. 
or my parents were arguing endlessly over whose fault it was. I sat in the front seat and Celine sat in the back. I guess she was wearing clothes Eleanor had worn when she was little, a blue jacket with a belt and a fake fur collar, corduroy jeans, and a pair of yellow rubber boots. Celine didn't look at me, but kept her head bent over the doll. Nothing unusual about that. Railroad Avenue was in the worst part of Woodville. We passed taverns, boarded up stores, abandoned gas station. A stray dog poked its nose into overflowing garbage cans that were half buried in snow. Newspapers blew down the icy sidewalks. A few people came in and out of a shabby market. Mrs. O'Neill drove slowly, looking for the house number. 4811, she said. This is it. She parked in front of the shabby little house that was badly in need of paint. The roof sagged under the weight of the snow. No one had shoveled the walk. No footprints led to the door. Do you think she's home? I asked. Let's find out. Mrs. O'Neill picked up Celine and led the way to the porch through knee-deep snow. Not a sound from inside. She pressed the bell, waited a while, and tried again. Maybe it's broken, I said. She nodded and knocked. Once, twice, several times. A shiver from cold and maybe a little fear. The house was run down and dark. One window was covered with a sheet of plastic, another boarded up. The porch buckled under our feet. The walls were sprayed with gang tags and badly drawn pictures of witches and devils and monsters. Just as we were about to give up, the door opened a crack and a woman peered out. She was not just old, she was ancient. Bent and bony, no bigger than Celine. Her flyaway hair floated around her head like dandelions gone to seed. She'd wrapped herself in a thick knitted shawl of every imaginable color woven into complex patterns. A sun here, a moon there, stars all over, rivers and trees and birds and animals. A person could look at it all day and still find something he hadn't noticed. What do you want with me? She croaked. Her eyes glittered in her shadowy face. Mrs. O'Neill put Celine down and held out her hand. I'm Irene O'Neill, and I've come, for you, I've come to you for help. The old woman looked at her hand. She didn't take it. I don't help strangers. She was about to slam the door in our faces. Wait, don't be so hasty, Mrs. O'Neill pushed Celine forward. What if I told you this girl is Celine Estes? Would you help us then? Miss Perkins froze. Instead of slamming the door, she leaned out and peered down at Celine, studying her as if she were a book she needed to learn. She touched Celine's cheek stared into her eyes, examined a strand of her hair. I think she even sniffed her. Shaking her head, she mumbled and muttered to herself and gazed over Celine's head at the darkening sky. At last, she spoke to Mrs. O'Neill. I smell auntie on this girl. I feel her touch. Celine tugged at Miss Perkins' arm. Can you make her take her back, ma'am? Uh, or can you make, make her take me back, ma'am? I'm still strong. I can do the work. Go back to Auntie? Whatever for? You told me to go live someplace else. She was done with me, but I ain't done with her. When Celine began to sob, Mrs. O'Neill tried to comfort her, but the girl pulled away. Leave me be, she cried. I don't want nobody but Auntie. I reckon you better come inside. Miss Perkins opened the door wide, and we followed her into a dark hallway. The house smelled of mildew and mold and cat pee. An old carpet, stained and worn, threw in spots, covered the floor. Bulging boxes and bundles stood in piles and stacks against the walls. It was a good thing Miss Perkins was a skinny little woman. A normal-sized person would need to turn sideways to squeeze down, the, squeeze down the hall. At the top of a flight of stairs, several cats stared down at us. Others crouched on the stacks of books. A few more wound around our ankles, meowing. To our left, raggedy velvet curtains framed a doorway into a small room that was also filled with bundles and boxes, with just enough space left for a sacking couch and a rocking chair. The windows were covered with blinds. A small fire burned on the hearth, barely enough to light the room, even though it wasn't much past three o'clock. Sit there on the sofa, Miss Perkins said as she took a seat in the rocking chair. Displacing more cats, the three of us crowded onto the sofa. Celine was on one side of Mrs. O'Neill and me on the other. Pressed close to her, I felt the tension of her body. I was tense too. Scared, even. The house reeked of dark secrets of sorrow and misery. I understood why Brody had refused to come with us. I glanced at Celine. She hadn't stopped staring at Miss Perkins. Maybe not even to blink. She and the doll had the same blank-eyed stare. Look on their faces. <clears throat> now then, Miss Perkins said to Mrs. O'Neill. 
Here's the way I see it. Auntie must have took the boy's sister when she let Celine go. She'll work his, her sister 50 years. Then, when she's worn out like this one, she'll let her go and take another girl. I ain't worn out. I can still do the work, Celine insisted. Miss Perkins ignored Celine. Closing her eyes, she rocked in her chair for a few moments, nodding to herself, clasping and unclasping her hands. You won't like it, but here's the truth of it, she said. Auntie's been doing this for over 200 years now. She's got no reason to quit, and I ain't got the power to stop her. I peered into the old woman's face. Her eyes, hidden by dropping lids and wrinkles, were set way back in her skull, so I couldn't guess what she was thinking or even be sure where she was looking. Please, I whispered. There must be something you can do to get Erica back. My parents are going crazy. Firelight danced across her face, making her wrinkles stand out as if they'd been carved into her skin. What on earth do you want me to do, boy? Can't you trade Celine back? Daniel! Mrs. O'Neill turned to me, obviously shocked. You don't mean that. It's what Celine wants, I told her, surprised at her disapproval of my idea. She said so herself. She wants to be with Auntie. Before Mrs. O'Neill could say a word, Miss Perkins said, Didn't I just tell you? That girl is worn out, used up. She's no good to Auntie, which is why she took your sister. Just take me to her, Celine begged. Give me a chance to show her I can still do the chores. Miss Perkins shook her head. I know it ain't easy, but you gotta make the best of your life here. The old woman sat down on her rocker, her face now hidden in shadows. She was quiet for so long that I thought she'd fallen asleep. I looked at Mrs. O'Neill and whispered, Should we leave? Miss Perkins must have heard me. I ain't sleeping, I'm pondering. With surprising energy, she pushed herself up out of her rocking chair. Y'all come back tomorrow afternoon. By then, I might have an idea or two. She walked to the door with us and watched Mrs. O'Neill help Celine with zippers and mittens. Poor child, Miss Perkins said softly. She's under a spell, like that girl who came back 50 years ago and died in the orphanage. When Auntie lets them go, they ain't long live with this world. Mrs. O'Neill stared at the old woman. Please don't talk like that in front of the child. Celine didn't seem to have heard. She was standing with her back to us, watching the cats racing each other and down the steps. Miss Perkins sighed. Ain't none of that girl, girl's fault my auntie took her. Must be something I can do to stop that old woman, her and that hog of hers. She opened the door and ushered us out. I'll see you tomorrow. With that, we were on the porch with the door shut behind us. It was dark now, and the silver of moon high above us didn't do much to light our way down the icy sidewalk to the car. Well, Mrs. O'Neill said as she started the engine, I don't know what to make of the old woman. Do you trust her? I asked. Mrs. O'Neill bit her lower lip and eased the car over the ruts in the icy road. In the headlights, I saw a skinny dog running along the sidewalk. He had something in his mouth. A scrap he'd found in the garbage, I guessed. I'm truly hoping she can get your sister back. How? I don't know. Just so it doesn't involve trading one child for another. She paused as she turned right from Railroad Avenue onto Main Street. It was only five o'clock, but not a single store was open. Except for the street lights and the traffic lights set on blinking red, the town was dark. I'm also hoping we can keep Celine from, with us for a long time, she said. I looked over my shoulder at the back seat. Celine was staring out the window, watching the buildings and houses slip past. Her face was pale and sad. The boy lay beside her as if she didn't care. Or sorry, the ball, <laughs> the doll lay beside her as if she didn't care about it anymore. I think she knew then that she'd never see Auntie again. Okay, that was chapter 15.